Amen. Okay, um, so 1 John 5, this morning we're in 1 John 4, and in 1 John 4, we found this morning that we had the three actions that the Spirit enables us to, to, um, to discern between truth and error, to overcome the world, to love one another. And we see some of that repeated at the beginning in the opening verses of 1 John chapter 5. And the title I'm giving this message tonight is what it means to believe. Because in 1 John 5, I believe we find three statements or three facts here about what it means to believe. First of all, the first fact here, the first truth of what it means to believe is that if we believe that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, we are born of God. Let's look at verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So if we believe we're born of God, now what, what does that entail? What does that mean? What the, how does that affect our life and change our life? Well, let's continue here. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. In other words, if we're born into God's family, he is our father, we're a child of God, just as John has emphasized throughout his uh, epistle of 1 John, then we should also love our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we love the one who begot us, that's God, we've been born into his family, then we should love others who have been begotten by him. They are also his children. So verse 2 continues this, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, and keep his commandments. See, our obedience to God shows that we love God. You know, there was a, I read a few illustrations in preparation for this message. One of them was, uh, there was once a young man who was engaged to be married, and he was going over the vows with the minister ahead of time, and he said, well, could you read that again? Okay, there's one problem there, one problem. It never says that my wife has to obey me. We need to put that in there. And uh, the fiance said, well, my love, uh, my obedience for you is written into my, the love in my heart. I lo I'm going to obey you because I love you. And that should be the way it is for, for us, that we, because we love God, we obey him. You know, and, and, and also as a child would obey uh, their parents because they, they love their, their father or their mother. And uh, want to honor them, want to to uh, respect them. Uh, we should uh, a child should love and obey the parents. And uh, Dan, do you think you could get the uh, turn the AC on? I know it might affect the sound, but it is quite warm in here. Uh, I think it's actually turned off right now. It's 74 degrees, but 74 feels really warm right now. At least where I'm standing. But uh, I, I can tell I can tell it's warm in here for all of you. But uh, so thank you, Dan. And uh, for this is the love of God. Look at verse three now. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Now that's just continuing here. If we're if we love God, we're going to obey him. One of his commandments, by the way, was love one another. That's one of his commandments. So we're going to love one another if we love God, because God commanded us to love one another. It all follows logically. And verse 3 is telling us that it, it just, just like the, uh, the fiancé, the bride, would want to obey the husband because she loves him, just like a child would want to obey the parent because uh, he or she loves the the father loves the mother. Um, we should want to obey the commandments. It's not grievous. It's not burdensome. Now, the commandments of men can be burdensome. Um, think of the Pharisees and the scribes. But uh, that was—that's not 
the way God's commands should seem to us. In fact, uh, Matt, in uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus describes his commands, his burden as light, and his yoke is easy. But in Matthew uh, 23, verse 4, he described the religion of man, the, the scribes and Pharisees, their requirements as being grievous burdens that they bound on people and were we're not willing to bear themselves. That's in uh, Matthew 23, verse 4. But when we love God, we'll find that uh, the things that he tells us to do are, are, should be the things we're wanting to do anyway. We're wanting to please him. Um, not not, not uh, like checking off a list of rules and regulations that is, is grueling and, and not enjoyable, uh, but rather what we want to do to please him and to be a good testimony for him, to let our light shine, to be the salt of the earth. And our faith, look at uh, verse four now, as a child of God, our faith is what overcomes the world. So we've mentioned the love of God, and it's kind of reverse order here from what we saw in chapter four, where the spirit enables us to love one another that love is mentioned here in verses two and three well overcoming the world as we saw in chapter four is mentioned again here in verse four this time in our faith is the emphasis as a being born of god because we're born of god we overcome the world through our faith and it's really through god because we're born of god and who our faith is in greater is he that is in us than it, he that is in the world we saw in verse five of chapter four, and uh, that we're that we overcome the world through He that is in us in chapter four, verse four. But here in chapter five, verse four, it says, "For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith." And uh, by the way, uh, in our English translations of the word faith, we have the word believe. It's really coming from the same word faith comes from. You know, Greek didn't have a, a different form for believe. It, it has the same uh, root word uh, from which we get faith, uh, just changing the suffix, changing the spelling a little bit, uh, and how it's used in a sentence. It's uh, the same word, faith and believe. And remember, whosoever believeth, verse 1, that Jesus is the Christ, Christ meaning Messiah is born of God. And verse 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth Jesus is the Son of God. So our faith, what faith? The faith that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The faith that believeth that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christ. That's what overcomes the world. Because now we're born of God. And, and we have, Jesus is the Son of God. We become sons of God, John 1, also written by John, of course. Uh, John 1, verse 12, emphasize, emphasizes this power that we're given by God through our faith. But as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So there's great power, a power that overcomes the world. The victory is the faith, believing that Jesus is the son of God. And that makes us a son of God. Not the same way that Jesus is God the son, because we don't become God but we become children of God, and therefore we love the other children of God. We overcome the world. We have this faith in God as the Son. What is it that we believe? We believe the witness. We believe the witness of the Holy Spirit, the truth that the Holy Spirit has convicted our hearts of, and the testimony that we find in the Word of God, the testimony of God the Father, and testimony of God the Son. And here we see the three persons of the Trinity in the following verses, bearing witness to that which we believe, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah. Look at verse 
6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Again, there was that idea that I've mentioned a couple of times in our study of 1 John that was becoming popular, that Jesus wasn't either wasn't fully human or wasn't fully God. One of the ideas emphasized the fact that when Jesus was baptized, when the Holy Spirit came upon him at his baptism, that's when the Christ came on him, that he wasn't the Christ before that, but he became the Christ. The Christ came down upon him when the Holy Spirit came down on him. But no, it wasn't just by water when he was baptized. It was by blood. He was born when he, uh, again, the virgin birth, very important there, when he was incarnated, became flesh, and dwelt among us. He was the Son of God. We're told that in John chapter 1, John 1, verse 14. In the beginning, uh, well, verse 1 was in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And going down to verse 14, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But then the Spirit also bears witness to that. And that does begin at the baptism of Jesus. And so these terms, water, blood, spirit, become important for the next couple of verses here in 1 John 5. And I wanted to look at a few other verses where, where those terms are used. One would be the baptism. But let's look again at this verse and put it together with the following, verse 6 and 7 here in 1 John 5. For the Son of God, remember, it's who we're talking about. Jesus is the Son of God. Very clear statement, verse 5. Jesus is the Son of God. This is he, and that's what we believe. That's what he's asking. Who overcomes the world? He that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, that's Jesus, the Son of God, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth and the spirit, the water and the blood, and these are three, and these three agree in one. By the way, there's some... It's not, I don't really see it as a controversy about this, these verses because they're very true. So I don't have a problem with these verses being here. Some people take issue with these verses being here because they say, well, it's not in the Greek. It's not in the Greek. Those verses don't exist in the Greek. And the, you know, the better transcripts or however they would say. Because actually, uh, when the King James was translated, they looked at not only the Greek, they looked at the Old Latin. And in the Latin, they had this verse, so they pulled it from the Latin and put it, put it into the King James, even though it wasn't in the Greek. But where does it end and in, in start in the Greek? It ends and starts in such a way that what the Latin had was a further explanation, further clarification, and it doesn't con contradict or add something new at all. It just emphasizes it a little bit more. Because if you were to take out the little bit uh, that you know they say is not in the Greek, which apparently is not from what I even learned in seminary, is that for there are three that bear record in heaven. That's where it ends in the Greek, verse 7. And then it goes down to verse 8, and these three agree in one. And, and, and just that little bit is taken out. But when you look what comes before and what comes after, it doesn't take the truth out that there's three. The three are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's still there, the verses prior and the verses after it. But I like having it all there in the King James. So this is another reason to stick with the King James. Go to another translation, they'll emphasize, put this in the margin, put it in the footnotes. Shouldn't be there. You know, uh, best manuscripts don't have this, all of that. But um, I like the King James. I like having these verses right here. Um, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these are three in one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So it, what, what, the, what this comma is doing here, what this little insert is doing here, these three bear witness on earth, it's explaining the spirit, water, and blood are pictures. They're earthly pictures of the heavenly persons of God. The, heavenly, the persons of God in heaven are God the Father, God the Son, the Word, okay, and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. 
three and one. And they three and one. So I want to go look at some other verses, particularly in John, but also a couple in Matthew, that talk about what what are we what are we describing here? The water, blood, the spirit. Now it seems clear, you know, Jesus is born of water and blood, we're told in the prior verses. Water and blood. And and and, and some would say, okay, the water is Jesus, blood is God the Father, the Spirit, of course, is the Holy Spirit. But let's look at some other verses that describe uh, these elements and they, these pictures here. And so I want to go back to starting with starting with Matthew 3, 13, at the baptism of Jesus. And then I want to go to John's account of the baptism as well. So John, uh, Matthew 3, verse 13. Matthew 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it cometh, uh, becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God. And there's that. So there's the word Spirit. There's where the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is bearing witness. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice. And here's the testimony of God the Father. So we have the Trinity right here in these verses. God the Son, Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And verse 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So these three agree in one. Here you have these three agreeing in one right here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you have the blood. You know, you know Jesus is born of blood and of water he's been baptized into water and the holy spirit is now coming upon him and the voice from heaven is bearing testimony that jesus is his son by blood so there's the blood picture this is my son that's the blood jesus is being baptized in the water and he's been born previously of water but he's been baptized in the water so you have water and that's jesus and then uh, in the water and the holy spirit coming down upon him bearing testimony all right some other pictures of these three um, the water, spirit, blood, or at least two of the three in, in some of these passages. Now let's go to, well, I also want to look at the baptism from John's perspective in John chapter 1. Uh, John chapter 1. In John 1. Uh, down in verse 29 is where it begins. John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. John was born actually before, physically born before Jesus. But Jesus preexisted John. And we're told that in Micah, when it's foretold that he'll be born in Bethlehem, that he pre-existed. He existed from eternity past. And uh, John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. So he pre-existed his birth. So he was before John the Baptist. And, uh, and here we have, uh, continuing verse 31, And I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. So John the Baptist tells his audience, including John himself is apparently in that audience, John uh, the disciple uh, versus John the Baptist here. Uh, and John is now recording his perspective here in the verse 33. Uh, well, excuse me, John the Baptist 
is recording his perspective. And I knew him not, but that he sent to baptize with water. The same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And I believe that is John, the writer of the book here, saying, I saw and bear record this is the Son of God. Okay, and so it's evidenced by the Holy Spirit and by the voice by, of God the Father and Jesus himself there that he is God's Son. Right there at his baptism. And we see the Trinity at the baptism. Now in verse uh, ch uh, 5 of chapter 3, if you stay in the book of John with me, and the Gospel of John, John 3, verse 5, this is shortly after, this is a couple verses after Jesus has told Nicodemus that he must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus was born by water. He had a physical birth. And, um, and we all have a physical birth. But we must also have that spiritual birth, uh, being born again by the Spirit coming upon us, being baptized by the Spirit when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we saw that in chapter 4 this morning, that the, if, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we have the Spirit of God. Uh, let's... Uh, Go also to chapter 12, verse 28. Chapter 12, verse 28. And here Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said, and it thundered. And others said, an angel spake to him. And verse 30, Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So Jesus is telling his disciples what's about to happen. Jesus is about to shed his blood at the cross. And God the Father is bearing witness leading up to that event of Jesus shedding his blood as well as water at the cross that Jesus is his son. And if you look at Matthew 27, let's look at the account of the cross and how God the Father bore witness at the cross that Jesus is the Son of God. We looked at this back at uh, Good Friday. Uh, look at uh, Matthew 27, verse, starting at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Then drop down from verse 45 to verse 50. Verse 50. Jesus then had, uh, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. There's the Holy Spirit. He yields up the Holy Spirit. So here you see the Trinity again mentioned at the cross. God the Son is on the cross. God the Holy Spirit, well, he, well, he yields up the ghost. You might say, well, he yields up his spirit personally. He, he gives up his life. Um, and behold, the veil of the temple, verse 51, was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many, and, and by the way, the veil was so thick, it'd be like you trying to take a piece of carpet and rip it. It's not possible. It couldn't just rip on its own. A little wind was not going to rip it. God tore it from top to bottom, right in half, dividing the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, which uh, symbolized the separation between God and man. Only the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and offer, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. But now... Christ's blood once for all atoned for our sin. And now that separation between God and man has been broken. And uh, then also look at verse uh, 53. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and, it came, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they 
that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly saying truly, this was the son of God. And but also, so the darkness in verse 45, the earthquake, people coming out of the graves, the veil ripping in the temple, God the Father was there, and Jesus, of course, cried out you know, in verse 46, Why hast thou forsaken me? He's talking to his Father on the cross. But God, through the darkness, through the earthquake, through the um, veil being ripped and the graves being opened, is also bearing testimony at the cross that Jesus is the Son of God, so much so that the centurion concludes this man must have been the Son of God. And then in uh, John's account of Jesus' death in John 19, he recognizes the witness of blood and water in Jesus' death, bearing witness that Jesus is the Son of God. Here, verse 34, John chapter 19, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it, that's John talking about himself here. That's how he often refers to himself. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he what he saith is true, that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. But notice, blood and water... <coughs> Uh, came from his side. So there's a few passages where blood and water are mentioned, or where God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are mentioned in bearing witness. The three are one, and the three together bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. And so by believing that testimony of God the Father, God the Spirit, uh, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, by believing their testimony, we become a child of God, and we love other children of God, we obey God, because we're now his son or his child. Look at verse uh, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he testifies of his son. So that is the testimony we're believing. When we believe that Jesus is the son, we're believing God. And, you know, we believe things that men tell us often. Um, you know, today, maybe not so much all the news, so sometimes it's better just to turn that off. And a lot of it becomes propaganda, but, you know, we believe a lot of things. You know, we go to the doctor, and the doctor tells us something, we generally will believe it, right? Um, we, 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 if we believe the testimony of people, which can lie, how much more should we not believe, should we believe the testimony of God who cannot lie, who is holy? And he testifies that God is that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God, the Son, the Messiah. And we believe that, and so we've been uh, adopted into his family. We've been born of God, and we become the children of God, and as a result, love other children of God. Okay, so the second um, statement of what it means to believe, we come to in verse 10. Now, first, if we believe... That Jesus is the Son of God, we're born of God. Second, if we believe, we have eternal life. Look at verse, verse, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. We're saying we don't believe the record of God that we just looked at here. Because he hath believed not the record that God gave of his Son, when God said, this is my beloved son, you know, we don't, we don't believe that because he, belie he, that, he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. So again, John chapter one, John makes a statement. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In, in the God the Son, we have eternal life. Romans 6, 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus, we have eternal life. If Jesus is not God's Son, we don't have eternal life. But if we believe that Jesus is God's Son, not only are we born of God, we're a child of God, we also have 
the promise, the assurance of eternal life. And verse 13, this is why John has been writing this letter, so that we would have this assurance. God wants us to know that we're his children and that we have eternal life if we have believed. So look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the Son of God. So for those who might not believe, that they would believe, and then they will be born of God. Then they will uh, have eternal life. But if we know God, we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we're born into his family, and we have eternal life. And third, if, we're, if we believe, it means that God answers our prayers as we keep ourselves from sin. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have of him. By, word, by the way, the, a confidence, that word confidence, also has to do with assurance. Remember, he wrote that we may know that we have eternal life. Also, another assurance that we have is when we pray and God answers our prayers, that's a promise God gives us as his children. Because we've been born of God, we're a child of God, and we have eternal life, we also are able to pray and see our prayers answered. God hears our prayers. And seeing prayers answered is another assurance that we're a child of God, that we have eternal life. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired him, desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So here, here's a great uh, interesting statement, is that we can pray for one another. When someone else um, sins, certainly we need to pray when we sin. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's very important. We should be confessing sin daily, uh, assuming we all sin daily, uh, whether it's pride, whether it's you know, gossip, whether it's uh, uh, just uh, neglecting something that we shouldn't have neglected, to read God's word, to pray, to, to share the gospel, um, whatever it may be. Um, but we can also pray. We, have, we can bring petitions to God in prayer and if we see that we have a, a, a fellow child of God, a, a, a fellow believer, a fellow brother in Christ that sins, and it's not something that would cause God to remove him from this world, because ultimately, um, you know, if, if someone damages their ability to be used by God in this world too far, that is one uh, thing that God, that God tells us in other places as well, that, uh, and we see it in the Old Testament as a principle, but uh, Ananias, Sapphira, for example, could in the Acts commit the sin unto death by lying to the Holy Ghost, and God removes them uh, from this earth. If they're not committing a sin worthy of death, that God would just remove them completely because they can't be used by God anymore, we can pray that God will forgive them and God uh, can heal them. He shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. Anything that's not right is sin. It's not right, it's sin. And there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. So if we want God to hear our prayers, we need to be keeping from sin. And that's been something that John has been talking about previously, that if we are walking in the light, if we're, if we're walking with God, we're walking in the light because he is light. And we can't be in the darkness and walk with God. We're not walking with God. We're not living for God. If we're sinning, we're not to be sinning. We can't just live in sin. If someone is just living in sin and cares not at all that, that it is sin, you know, his, his conscience isn't bothering him. He just continues uh, through life, and, you know, maybe believing that, oh, God is just going to overlook that. That's okay. Um, that, that person may not be a child of God. But, you know, a, a believer, when he sins, should feel that um, 
conviction and, and bring that confession, agreeing with God it's wrong, and turning from it. You know, um, in Psalms speaks of, you know, a righteous man falls seven times and, and gets up again. And that might refer to sin. It might refer to, uh, you know, failing in other ways other than sin. But um, God giving us the power to, to, to rise again, you know. And Jesus told Mary Magdalene, you know, when, when he said, neither do I condemn you, when all the accusers walked away, he said, go and sin no more. We're called to not sin to keep ourselves from sin and really god helps to keep us from sin when we're spending time in his word when we're spending time in prayer he enables us he helps us keep from sin and when we're keeping from sin when we're praying that's a confidence go back to verse 14 it helps provide assurance if we don't have that assurance of salvation it could be that we're not saved it could be that we're not reading our, the Bible, or it could be that we've committed sin and it's making us feel like we're, we're not right with God and we need to be right with God. We need to confess it, forsake it, and be, walk with God. And uh, look at verse 18. And we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So what's that mean? The wicked one toucheth him not. I think it refers to the protection that we receive when we're, when we're walking with God, we're confessing our sins, we're um, seeking to um, be in God's word and follow God's word, read it and obey what we read, that God gives us protection that isn't there from, the, from Satan, whether it's a spiritual, emotional, or even physical buffeting of the devil that God might allow if we're sinning, if we're walking in sin and God wants us to steer us back out of that sin and be right with God, uh, then apparently the wicked one can touch us, but, the, but not, um, and obviously the wicked one can touch anyone eventually and, and uh, that is not a child of God. He doesn't have the divine protection, but for a child of God, we have protection from the wicked one. We have protection from the devil when we're right with God. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So these things help give us that confidence, help give us that assurance that we know God hears our prayers, he answers our prayers, we keep from sin, the wicked, we're protected from the wicked one, even though the world is full of wickedness, we belong to God. Um, verse 20, and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. Again, thinking back to the beginning of chapter 4, understanding, seeing the difference between right and wrong, between truth and error. You know, the, uh, the unsaved can't understand. To them, the, the, the Bible is too difficult to understand. Um, for an immature believer, you know, um, the Bible may be a little bit difficult, may be a, a labor. But as we grow in Christ, the Holy Spirit, as we uh, enables us to understand God's word, and we, there should be desire and enjoyment and a fulfillment that we want to read God's word. It's uh, the milk, it's the meat that we grow spiritually by. And that also helps provide that confidence, that assurance that we are God's children and that he protects us. We have eternal life. Look at verse 20. And we know the son of God is come and hath given us understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in the son, in his son, Jesus Christ. And again, we can't be in between. We're either in his son and the Holy Spirit is in us or we're out of his son. I mean, we, don't, we never had the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and then leaves if we sin. I, not at all. Um, in the Old Testament, now the Holy Spirit would come upon someone like King Saul and then leave. Uh, and, and David was praying in the Psalms, don't, don't allow the Holy Spirit to leave me. He saw what happened to King Saul. He played the harp for King Saul to try and soothe him. He saw what that was like. But for believers today, the Holy Spirit comes and, and dwells with us. Can we grieve the Holy Spirit? Can we quench the Holy Spirit? Well, it seems that we can because we're told not to do those things. That seems to indicate we can do, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. If we do something that is sinful, 
if and if we're not spending time with God in prayer in God's word, uh, then we're you know, we're quenching the Holy Spirit, and and instead we're opening ourselves to you know doubts and to fears and to um, not understanding what God has for us, and uh, that we may know Him that is true. Verse twenty. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, isn't that interesting? We end right there. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. This is the true God, eternal life. Jesus is the true God. He's eternal life and he is the true God. Any other um, statement about Christ. You know, if, the, if someone says he's not God, well, that's an idol then. Um, they're worshiping an idol because they're not worshiping the true God. Jesus Christ is God the Son. God is three in one, as we saw in this passage. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Any other identification of God is an idol. And we're to keep ourselves from that. This is the true God in eternal life. So we've seen tonight God wants us to have assurance of our salvation. He wants us to know that we have eternal life. So we, in this passage, we see what it means to believe. If we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, then we are born of God. We become a child of God. And there's traits that come with that. We love other children of God. We obey God. We want to obey God. And we find that, it's, it's, it, that burden is light. It's not grievous to us to obey God. We want to because we love him. And we believe that record of God, and so we have eternal life. That's what it means for us to believe. We're born of God, we have eternal life, and finally, God answers our prayers as we keep from sin. And that those answers to prayer and keeping ourselves from sin is further proof that we've believed. Because if we don't believe that Jesus is Son of God, you know, what motivation would we have to keep her from sin? I, I know that someone who's an unbeliever can uh, be a morally good person in some ways, but they just don't have the same motive for their actions that a believer has. We have the motive of pleasing our Heavenly Father that he gave his son to die in our place, and we owe him our life and our love and our obedience and we have now the ability to have our petitions heard. When we're right with God, he hears our petitions. We see prayers answered, and that bears further witness that we're the child of God and gives us an assurance that God wants us to have. He wants us to know that we're his child, that we have eternal life, and that he hears our prayers as we keep from sin. Um, let's... Uh, Let's close in prayer, and then I'll uh, we'll sing one one closing song and be able to visit a little bit here, uh, if you like, at a distance. But thank you for joining us tonight, those of you on Zoom and those of you here. Let's close in prayer, and we'll sing one more song. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have joined us for this study in in First John, both this morning and, and this evening. A little bit different forms, a little smaller group tonight, and um, but we thank you for your word that is just is true in first john 4 is, is 5 and in every passage of the scripture i thank you for those here whether on zoom or in person right here in this room have who have believed your word i pray that we will take the time to continue spending time in your word and growing in our walk with you and keeping ourselves from sin so that we'd have this assurance as we separate ourselves from sin and to, to you because we're your child, as we love one another because we're all your children, if we've been born of you, and that we'd know we'd have this eternal life. We'd have that assurance, Lord. I pray that each one here, whether on Zoom or in person, would know for sure, for with 100% certainty, that they have eternal life, that they're your child, that you hear our prayers because we're your child and you have forgiven our sin. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sin, Lord. We pray that we will confess the, our sins daily and walk with you and keep ourselves from sin, that we wouldn't uh, have idols, anything that would come before 
you in our life. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given. I pray that we would see this as a great opportunity in our nation's history right now to see the things that sometimes are idols in our life, you know, false versions of you destroyed before our eyes and, 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 and things that become more important to us than you. There's so many things that are closed now, sports and uh, other things. And But Lord, I pray that we would, uh, when things start to return to more of a normal, that we wouldn't uh, just go back to the way things were, but that we would have grown in our relationship with you, our assurance of our salvation, and just the purpose that we find in you as your child for the time that we have left in this world. And I pray, Lord, that we can continue to assemble and to gather, that you would continue to give us that freedom and that protection, that you keep everyone here uh, safe from the virus, um, and Lord, uh, that you keep churches across this country safe from uh, any prosecution of the government going forward, and that everything will be allowed to open up and have the freedom to assemble and to worship you and to provoke one another to love and good works and so much the more as we see the day of your return and the judgment on this world approaching. Lord, I, I thank you for this time together. I pray you bless each one as we go from here now, as we close with this song. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, if you join me.